Good morning and welcome to Veterans Heartbeat on the Pulse of the Veteran, where we discuss issues of health, happiness, opportunity, and well-being of interest to the veteran community, their families, and the community who honors them. Good morning and welcome to another episode of Veterans Heartbeat, brought to you by River, the Rural Institute for Veterans Education and Research. My name is Jason Zentgraf and my co-host is Ed Lasofsky. He is the Executive Director of River. We welcome you to a weekly wide-ranging discussion of issues, events, opportunities, and needs in our veteran community. Morning, Ed. How are you doing? Good morning, Jason. We would like to thank our sponsor, The Man Shop. It's a great place for a guy to get a haircut. If you need a haircut, swing on by and check them out. The gals there do a great job. We are also sponsored by River, the Rural Institute for Veterans Education and Research. They offer many services to veterans, such as weekly free TBI and vestibular testing, and educational programs that focus on veterans helping veterans. So today, we're going to focus on the Republican and Democratic convention that happened over the weekend. Austin Knutson, the Speaker of the House, is here with us to talk about the things that happened over the weekend. Well, it's, it's a great honor to have the Speaker of the Montana House on the show with us this morning. Um, Austin, good morning. Good morning. So it's been an exciting week for you guys. You had a convention. You selected a candidate for Congress, and it sounds like from the polling that we just got that he's got a really good lead. Can you tell us a little bit about the convention, how that went down? It's kind of unusual to replace a sitting congressman, so it's something I think the listeners might want to hear about. Yeah, well, we found ourselves in a really interesting situation. Uh, But we, we... We have, for the first time in Montana's history, uh, someone from Montana nominated to be in the president's cabinet in a a pretty high-up position. Uh, So Congressman Zinke was selected to be the Secretary of the Interior. So the way that works under state law is because he's a sitting congressman, or he was a sitting congressman, uh, when he actually was confirmed as the Secretary of the Interior by the U.S. Senate, at that point he has to vacate his congressional seat. And so what that does under Montana law is it triggers a special election. And what Montana law says is that within 85 to 100 days, the governor has to set the date for a special election. Um, So the day he was uh, confirmed, Governor Bullock set that election for 85 days out, which was a very very short time frame. So... Um, each party had uh, the, the, the Democrat Party, the Republican Party, and then the, the Libertarians are going to do it, too. We, they, under state law, we had to get together, and we had to basically have our own internal primary uh, where the, the parties get to select their own candidate because we're working on such a truncated timetable. Um, so the Democrat Party had theirs on uh, Saturday. We had ours on month. Uh, excuse me, theirs was Sunday. Democrat Party had theirs on Sunday. We had ours the next day on Monday. Uh, and we both parties now have a candidate. And I, I haven't heard about the Libertarians yet, but I suspect that will be happening pretty quickly here, too. You had a really, really rich, full bunch of candidates for the special selection. We, we did. We had, we had a big slate. I mean, we ended up having, uh, I think, seven uh, by the time we were all said and done there at the convention. There, there had been... There had been at least one more who who had dropped off at the last. Oh, I, two more, two that I know of that dropped off. Uh, but yeah, we had we had uh, some, some current legislators. We had some you know former party officials. Uh, we had just some 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 business people who were interested in seeking the nomination. Um, so we we did we, we we had a we had a good big bench. We had uh, some good discussions, some good forums, and overall we we had a really good day. I'm very happy with the choice we made. Uh, we picked uh, Greg Gianforte, who, as the listeners probably know, ran for governor this last this last time, narrowly was defeated, uh, you know, against a very popular sitting incumbent Democrat. Uh, but you know, the the thing with this special election is it's it's happening within such a short time frame that, from from a, a Republican Party standpoint, we we needed a candidate who could hit the ground running. Uh, had had the campaign apparatus in place, and frankly, you know, had had some good name ID because, you know, really absentee ballots are going to go out here within about a month. So we're talking about a very very short time frame to campaign for this congressional seat. 
we were all, of course, hoping, hoping and pushing for Greg to win the governor's seat, but it didn't work out. Um, so now, uh, yeah, like you, like you said, we, we've got a great opportunity here. He's, he's got all the campaign apparatus there. In fact, he's, he's already raised a, a pretty amazing sum of money for this campaign, and I, uh, he's, he's, he's literally ready to hit the ground, and he, he has. So I, I think we made a great pick. Yeah, and he won pretty overwhelmingly. I mean, it was with that many candidates... Uh, you know, the candidate had to get 51 percent, and he, and he won on the first ballot. So it was it was pretty overwhelming. Well, it sounds like the party really has rallied around this candidate. Greg is an excellent businessman by stature of what he's been able to do in his career. So that's really good. Let's- yeah, and I mean, frankly, I've I've gotten to know Greg, spent some time with he, with he and his family, and he he really is what he what he appears to be. <laughs> He's just a nice guy. He's a really genuine, down to earth guy. Uh, you you'd never know that he was as successful a businessman that he is, just because he's he's such a humble, uh, everyday guy. Uh, so I'm I'm excited to have him there. Let's switch uh, gears a little bit here, if you don't mind, Austin. Sure. Um, it's been an exciting legislative period. There's been. A lot of things going on. Uh, you had transmittal deadline, which means that all the general bills, or can you explain what transmittal means? Sure. So for, the, for your listeners, uh, the, the legislative session lasts 90 days every other year, and that's laid out in our state constitution. That's, that's not something we get to mess with. Uh, so we've got 90 days every other year to come to Helena and, and, and get the people's business done. So Transmittal break is literally the halfway point. It's it's like half time, uh, and because there's there's two chambers, what the transmittal deadline does of day 45, it says you know. So let's just say, for instance, in the House, it's, if I had started a piece of legislation in the House, it's it's gone through committee. Uh, I have to have it completely through the House process and transmitted over to the Senate by day 45. Or that bill dies in the process. Uh, it's 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 a hard deadline, uh, and and you said that's for general bills, and that that's actually a term of art. I mean, a, a general bill. I mean, we call it a cat and dog bill, but it's 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 a bill basically that doesn't spend any money or generate any money. Those that that's an appropriation bill or a revenue bill, and those are subject to a later transmittal deadline. Uh, that'll be at the end of this month now. Um, but, yeah, I mean, generally speaking, the last week right before transmittal, it gets very, very busy, very, very hectic. It, you know, we've got a lot of freshman legislators who realize, oh, no, my bill that I thought I had all this time on, uh, you know, it hasn't gone through the committee process. I've got to get it through the committee and across the floor twice uh, on, on two votes before it can get to the Senate. Um, so we end up having some, some late days some very big agendas to try to get everyone's bills through the process and uh, across to the Senate. So let's switch gears a little bit here, Austin. Um, We met you during a round of trying to get a a law passed, and that, that gets really interesting for somebody that doesn't know the process, how to advocate for an issue. Can you explain a little bit about the best way you see, as the Speaker of the House, how somebody should be advocating for their issues? Sure. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a really good question and a, and a really good piece of information. So I, I've been up here four sessions now. This, this is my fourth and final term. I'm, I'm now termed out of the House. The absolute best way to come and advocate for a piece of legislation is, I mean, really, truly, is to show up in person. Um, and, and to come not only testify in committee, right, because that, that's the first step. The first step when, when a bill is introduced, a piece of legislation, uh, you know, you think it's a great idea, it has to go through the committee first. Okay, so it'll get assigned to the appropriate committee. That committee will have a full hearing on that bill. That's where the public has their opportunity to come and testify and talk to legislators on that committee about how, you know, either why this bill is a great piece of legislation and should be passed, or in the inverse, you know, why it's a bad piece of legislation and why it, why it should be killed. The absolute best way to advocate for legislation is to come up here. It's not convenient. I mean, we, we, fully, we fully understand that, and, and we try to make it as convenient as we can with scheduling, but 
there, there's no substitute for coming, being at the Capitol, meeting with legislators face-to-face, talking to them in committee, uh, grabbing them in the hallways. I mean, be, be a citizen lobbyist. Uh, you know, that's very effective. Uh, that's, that's probably the, the single most effective way to, to move legislation forward, is to actually come here, talk to your legislators, talk to other legislators. You know, grab members of the committee in the hallway and tell them, uh, you know, why you think this is, this is a good bill or why you think it's a bad bill. Um, you know, a lot of people send letters. A lot of people send in phone messages. They send in email messages. Though, it's not that those are not as effective. Well, but they are not as effective. They're effective. I mean, we all get we all get email messages. We all get phone messages. Um, you know, I get them all electronically, but a lot of legislators get a big big stack of messages on their desk every day. Um, sure, we absolutely read them. I mean, I read every message that comes to me. But there is absolutely no substitute for coming up to the Capitol and wearing out shoe leather and, and meeting with legislators face to face. One of the uh, issues that brought Jason and I to the Capitol is we've been working up in your district with a lot of your veteran constituents and that's one of the reasons we asked you on the show you've been really grateful to us up there and we are working to try and allow the emergency care providers emts paramedics in this state to allow them to do what's called community paramedicine for veterans that being said we're still working on a bill with you, and it's it's been a really interesting experience for somebody that hasn't really been in the legislature. So with that being said, the bill will require some revenue, so it's, it's not dead yet, but it, it got tabled in committee. Can you explain all that to the listeners? Sure. and I, I mean, I, I'm going to have to be be pretty high level because I mean this this wasn't a bill that I was involved in and, and honestly it wasn't a bill that was on my radar. Um, I mean one of the one of the, I guess the curses of being the speaker of the house is I you know I, I'm in charge of administration of the house and making sure the house gets its business done and I, I I don't get to spend the time dealing with individual bills that I used to before I was you know the speaker of the house. But with, but with that said, um, so the the way this process worked is. As I understood it, it's, it was a bill that went to the House Human Services Committee. Um, I think, generally speaking, there there was support for the bill, but I think there were a few technical problems with it that the committee found. Um, I, for whatever reason, they they didn't think that those problems could be corrected in time, and I'm not sure what what happened there. If, if the bill was introduced late in the process, or it didn't get a hearing soon enough. I, I don't know the answer to those questions. That, that's, that's not my committee. I don't serve in that committee. I, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know. What I do know is that uh, there was an attempt to do what we call a blast motion. And so what a blast motion is, the entire body of the House can vote to remove a bill out of committee, even if it's been tabled in committee, you, you can bring it to the floor for a full vote. So there was an attempt... Uh, within one day of the transmittal deadline, which is what you'd have to have, because it has to have two votes within two days. Uh, so that there was an attempt to blast it to the floor. Um, you know, we had a, we had a had a decent discussion about that, but the, the the motion to blast ultimately died. So that put us in a position where, I mean, effectively that bill is dead, right? I mean, it's it's tabled in House Human Services. It missed the transmittal deadline. That bill's dead. Okay, so now how do we fix this problem? Okay, and then so so this is where I got involved. Uh, this is where this is where we met. This is where I I, I met one of my new constituents, uh, which I was very happy to meet her and and offer my services to help here. What we have to do practically is, I mean, we can run the same bill as a as a new bill, but we'll have to make it subject to a later transmittal deadline, which it means it either has to spend money, or it has to generate money. So I think what we can do, and I've already found a couple of bill titles we can fit these into, um, we can put the language in, we can add some sort of a nominal fee uh, that, you know, frankly can probably be amended out later, but just to make it, make it a revenue bill 
subject to the March 30th transmittal deadline, we can add that language in, and we can basically start this process all over. We'll start it. We'll start it in the House. We'll have to remove some of the language that the that the committee had problems with, or or, or, or try to address it, try to fix it somehow. And I'm not sure what all the all that language was. I, I know one of the problems that that the committee had was there was some language in that bill about allowing these EMTs or, or paramedics to use some sort of acupuncture, um, and I think. The committee had some heartburn with that because in a separate portion of Montana law, we require licensure for acupuncturists. So I think the, the, the fear was we had some conflict in law there. I, and I know I, that was just one of the issues. I, I don't know if there were others or what they were. But, um, you know, bottom line, I think that the clock is ticking, but it's early in May. I think we can get this thing drafted and put in. Uh, and and hopefully get it across the finish line and get it over to the Senate. Now we're going to focus on traumatic brain injury and vestibular disorders, and more importantly, how to test for them. So we have in the studio with us Skip Frapier, and he is an expert in vestibular and TBI testing. How are you doing, Skip? Dandy, Jason. How are you? <laughs> oh, not dandy, but pretty good. <laughs> so, Skip, River just added a new service. It's testing for vestibular disorder, the inner ear issues, that deal with balance and other things. He'll get into it a little bit deeper. And then also traumatic brain injury. So do you want to go over what this testing involves and what it's looking for? We didn't call this VNG as the shorter acronym for it. It actually stands for uh, visual nystagmography. That's why we call it VNG. Well, Skip, it's really exciting to have you here in the studio. And it's been an interesting week with you training us up at River. There was a recent study from the VA. Can you tell us about how the vestibular disorders correlate with PTSD? Well, we know a lot of the current research that's been coming at us has been looking for relationships of vestibular imbalance issues and how they relate to traumatic brain injury and how they're treated or not treated in a lot of cases and the relationship between brain injury and the stress and emotional dist- uh, problems that it does cause. So. In the work that we do at River, we found a lot of the crisis work, these guys are getting diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. The study that we recently read um, correlated with the study that we've been doing. The VA found an 81% correlation between PTSD and vestibular disorders. Could this be the physical disorder that's missing link in treating PTSD? It certainly could be. And again, there's a lot of research that yet is yet to be done, um, a lot of traumatic brain injury that yet to be discovered. But this is a tremendous step in the right direction and definitely looking forward to working with, with you and your staff. It's groundbreaking. And the machine that you were talking about, and I'm not even going to attempt to say that big old name, so I'll just say VNG. How many of these are in the area? How many machines for testing veterans are there available? Well, there's a lot available, but how many are actually being used and applied uh, in the veteran world? Probably very few that I know of. From the relationship that we have with our manufacturer, um, this is the only second application that I know of that's dealing with any VA-related issues. What about in Montana? Can a veteran just walk into any place and get tested? Not with this type of technology. Um, High-definition cameras, uh, dual-camera observations, repeatable, reliable. To my knowledge, no. I don't know of other um, opportunities in Montana where this can be found. Okay, so you've got all this technology. How is it that once you do the test that we find out the results? Basically, our entire mission with you guys is is to become a data collection point. So the more veterans that we can treat, the more traumatic brain injuries and PTSD uh, patient database that we can create gives us more solid information to start creating treatment pathways and also looking at physical therapy pathways that are directed, uh, that are actually directed from the results that we get from VNG testing. We do a lot of work with ATS uh, still out of... um, Arizona. Um, Dr. Troy Hale is one of our um, experts down in there. So we actually send him an electronic file. He takes a look at it. Typically, they're 11 to 13 pages in length. 
he dissects them, does the magic work that he does, and sends us a result, what we call an overread, back to us, typically within 48 hours. So within 48 hours, a veteran can find out if they're really crazy or if they have some kind of physical ailment. Well, if they're crazy or they've been told they're crazy, are they actually crazy or can we help? <laughs> Does that make any sense? <laughs> it makes total sense because a lot of these guys can't figure out why they went to war with no mental illness and 40 plus percent are coming back with a diagnosis of PTSD. It just doesn't make sense. Well, part of that thing that we are trying to take a look at, too, is what we call kind of the anxiety factor to it. When you get your foot too far, for instance, away from Mother Earth, there's kind of an anxiety factor that builds up because you don't know where that Mother Earth is going to go to. It's no different. I call it the senior shuffle. We all know a lot of people. My parents, for instance, my dad does it. They walk around and they drag their heels on the ground. And part of it is, is because the farther their foot gets away from Mother Earth, the less unsure of himself he becomes, which becomes stressful. Now, does that relate to PTSD as well? Absolutely it does. So it's groundbreaking work that River's doing with your company. Can you tell us the name of the company? We actually are working under a kind of a national name called Better Balance. Um, and our entire mission, obviously, is to try and create awareness and not just to create awareness within our medical community, but also to create awareness within the VA community that there is help, that there is an opportunity for us to provide care. And that, again, we call it part of that concussion or uh, PTSD toolbox. We believe that we are a valuable tool in that PTSD toolbox. Jason, we've been working with veterans for about five years now, and we've seen a lot of improvement with other things such as acupuncture, non-pharmaceutical-based treatments. Uh, you're the expert when it comes to proprioception. Can you explain how this fits into your world? There are so many things to touch on what you, with what you just said. Um, first off, you know, these guys and gals get back from war. They see, oh, you know, depression, anger, anxiety, whatever. That could be PTSD. That could be traumatic brain injury. That could be a vestibular disorder. But the standard protocol is, oh, that's tr it's PTSD. So then here you go. We give them... Um, or we don't, but the doctor gives them all these pharmaceuticals. Now, the problem with pharmaceuticals is they could work amazing for me and be absolutely terrible for you. You know, uh, there was a study published where 40% of the people given SSRIs responded to them. Fantastic. Okay. Low percentage. But then 30% of that same group responded to the placebo. So it's, it's very, very hard to tell. Every single person is different and every single person is going to react differently to each drug, uh, not to even mention multiple drugs reacting together. So that is just a huge, huge issue. And it's, um, it, it, it's a hard puzzle to put together. So aside from the drugs, which is a big headache, um, uh, b besides that, so say somebody does get diagnosed with a vestibular disorder. So what do we do? How do we treat that? It's just, okay, you have this, this issue. Good luck. See you out there in the world. No. Well, what they do is um, they refer them to a physical therapist. A lot of people could help, but a physical therapist is probably going to be the best option because they know this material very well. They're going to do things like uh, balance testing, use stability balls, BOSU balls, which is kind of looks like a bubble, <laughs> and, uh, and a lot of things that will challenge their stability of standing there. So you increase the challenge of your balance, you increase your balance. Obviously, it seems simple, but that's what they're going to do. The other thing is uh, proprioceptive drills. Now, big fancy term. Basically, without getting too technical, proprioception is controlling your body with your eyes closed. Now, how fast can your brain tell your muscles and vice versa that you're starting to fall forward or back or left or right? So there's different balance exercises going from, you know, a certain stance to a tighter stance to a staggered stance to single-legged, and it kind of progresses harder and harder. And doing these repeatedly can really increase some of that proprioception response, some of the uh, balance issues that some of these people will experience. Now, what I've seen with the symptomology that they need to be aware of out in the veterans' world, if you have bouts of um, nausea, wanting to throw up, for no unknown reason, just it comes up, that might be a cause of it. If you feel a little bit of dizziness, 
uh, ringing in the ears. These are signs that you should be tested for this disorder. There are several other areas that can be added to that too. Light sensitivity, uh, noise sensitivity, again, numbness in your hands, um, weakness, one side versus the other, blurred vision. Um, again, as you mentioned, ringing in the ears. Uh, another one, obviously, migraines, um, vertigo. Any of, the, any of those are basically symptoms, could be potential symptoms of a traumatic brain injury. What I've seen or heard from a lot of the veterans is their ears feel full, like when you're flying and you've got ears. So there's a lot of symptoms that we've got to look for. The pressure that a lot of patients feel um, in their head, whether it's behind their eye sockets or behind one ear versus the other ear, that absolutely are things that we treat and things that we look into. Well, thank you very much for joining us this morning, Skip. I'm sure the listeners gathered a lot of good information about TBI, traumatic brain injury, and vestibular disorders. Well, thank you very much for listening to Veterans Heartbeat. We would not be able to bring this to you without the support of the listeners. Thank you again to The Man Shop for sponsoring the show. If you're in need of a haircut, swing on by and get a snip. Also, thanks to our main sponsor, River, the Rural Institute for Veterans Education and Research. They have an array of services such as veterans-focused education, a free TBI and vestibular disorder clinic, and many more services. Check them out on Facebook or on the web at riverofchange.org. Lastly, we would like to show our appreciation to all of our veterans. Thank you for serving our country and keeping us safe.